Well, welcome to the Moral and Ethical Leadership Podcast hosted by the BYU Management Society Salt Lake Chapter. I'm Dave Austin. And I'm Kurt Frankham. And part of the mission of the BYU Management Society Salt Lake Chapter is to provide scholarships to service-oriented high school seniors. And each year, approximately 50 deserving students are awarded scholarships to local colleges and trade schools. And if your family or business would like to join in providing scholarships to these future leaders by sponsoring a podcast, please contact us at byupodcast.slc at gmail.com, and we'd love to contact you. And each time we do one of these interviews, I feel so excited for the opportunity. I feel like I learn more than anybody by virtue of the chance to listen to each of our amazing guests. And today we have the incredible opportunity to meet with someone who needs no introduction, Gail Miller. <laughs> Gail, how are you doing today? And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm doing well. I'm pleased to be here. Thank you for asking me. Well, thank you so much for your time. And Gail, I feel honored to be able to be speaking with you. And I was wondering if just for my first question, if you wouldn't mind telling us about yourself and things you're passionate about, and maybe also about your family or anything that you'd like to tell us about, uh, about, about the Miller family and about you. <laughs> Well, I, that's easy. I know a lot about me, but <laughs> <laughs> it all seems boring to me. But I, I was actually born and raised in Salt Lake City, right near uh, Temple Square, about three blocks north and a block and a half west of the Capitol building. So right in that Marmalade district. Um, I uh, come from a large family. My mom had nine kids, five of them during the Depression, which made us a very poor family. Jobs were scarce, money was scarce, uh, and I was the sixth of nine, so I got um, I got to experience that on the tail end. But you know, once you're poor, you hardly ever recover from that. So I learned a lot from being poor. I learned that it doesn't have to shape who you are. You can have high aspirations. You can learn a lot. I learned how to do many things that I might not have learned how to do had I had other opportunities. I worked for the telephone company when I was in high school. Um, I got married about three years out of high school after dating my husband for six years. Mm -hmm. And we lived in Salt Lake for five years, had two children, and then moved to Colorado. He was recruited to play softball for a team in Colorado. He loved to pitch. It was a world-class team. He had aspirations of going to the world nationals, uh, the world competition. Actually, there were two. There was the nationals in the world, but either one would have been fine for him, which he did several times. We had three more children while we lived there. We became reactivated in the church there. Uh, we moved back to Salt Lake in 1979 and started our business with one Toyota dealership in Murray, Utah. Mm. That was the springboard for our um, opportunity to create some security for our family and to do a lot of other things that we had no idea would happen to us. Mm. We, um, we had a lot of doors open for us that we didn't expect. We thought we'd have one dealership, support our family, provide good jobs for those 30 or so people. That expanded over the last 42 years to a huge business organization and has provided many, many jobs. Like we had 11,000 employees at one time we, we created um, our business on values that we believed in and created a mission that we wanted to enrich lives. That's been our focus all through our career. My husband died in 20, oh, not 2009. He asked me at that time to stay involved with the companies because he felt I needed to be the bridge from me to the kids who were actually in positions of authority at the time. He had taught me well. He, he gave me classes every night in business 101 on what he was doing and how he was doing it and helping me to understand um, what he wanted to have happen. So as I 
stepped in to be that bridge, I could see that he was right. Business was really fun. And I have stayed involved these last 12 years since he's been gone. Our company has prospered. We've grown a lot. That's probably enough. I'll let you start asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And, and Gail, I'm curious, you know, when you think about those early years, whether in your, you know, teenage years or your early marriage or your early business life, was there an experience or a person or something that really helped you establish moral and ethical leadership in, in the culture of your business and in your life? I, yes, my family did that. My mother, especially, she always taught me that I could be and do anything I set my mind to do, but that uh, doing it on gospel principles was the way to live. And that was very strongly established in our home. That was the main focus of our home. It wasn't until I was a senior in high school that I had a job. I got busy dating. I left my activity in the church. Never lost my testimony, but just quit going to church. But that really let me know that those foundational beliefs are things that you build on all your life. They're, they're ingrained in you if you accept them. And I did, and I feel very blessed that my mother taught me well, taught me that, you know, there were a lot of sayings she had, like, the glory of God is intelligence, learn all you can, be a strong person, don't, don't slack. Um, she taught me that cleanliness is next to godliness. Even though we were poor, we could still be clean and present ourselves in a nice uh, in a good way. Um, we could make do with what we had. We could create, taught me how to sew, how to cut hair, how to, how to do a lot of things that were basic creative things. So I think those foundations served me well. And I know that in Larry's home, he was brought up in the gospel, although his parents left the church when he was 16 and it was his group of friends that kept him close. Although we were dating and, and we relied on each other, but he was taught the same, the same basic principles. He had a little harder time coming out of that disruption in his life and finding himself. Thank goodness. He had people around him that helped keep him steady but um, I think that's really the foundation for how we've lived our lives and how we've grown our business. Yeah, that's great. And I wanted to ask you, you're such a well-known and, and visible person. Do you ever feel pressure in your position and being so well-known? And how do you deal? If so, how do you deal with that pressure? Um. It's interesting. I was at a luncheon yesterday. In 2012, I was given the honor of being an Athena. I got the Athena Award. Yesterday, I went to a lunch with the Athenas who are still alive after they, they started that in 1985. I mean, that's a group of really strong women. And they asked each of us to get up and say a few words. And my words were, before Larry died, I was invisible because Larry was out in front doing everything and I was the homemaker and raising kids. Um, the pressure didn't come until after he died and I stepped into the position I'm in today, but I don't feel pressure. I feel responsibility. Hmm. What I have found is that I can be a catalyst for good and I can be an example and it's been surprising to me how many young women are interested in what I've done and how I've done it, because it's, it's a roadmap for them to be successful. And that's been a, I wouldn't say it's a pressure, but I would say it's an opportunity to be a mentor hmm. and a responsibility to do it in the right way with the right focus and values and guidelines. And I, to me, that's just being who I am, because that's all I know how to do. I can't be anyone else. And I'm grateful that I feel comfortable in my own skin. 
Yeah, that's that's awesome. And I'm curious, Gail, like as you reflect back on the many years of of leading these these organizations, was there one message or quote that you found yourself repeating more often than others? And and why is that? I don't know that I'd say there's any quote. I I think um, some of the some of the things that I have used as springboards our values, um, making sure that our company has a strong foundation of values. And we did that deliberately. Deliberately, My youngest son and I created a program after Larry died called Who We Are because he wasn't here. He did all of that while he was alive. But then as he as time passed and people didn't know him personally, that value, that, that opportunity was lost. So we created a program and we, we decided to do it based on the values that we did build our business on, which are hard work, integrity, service, and stewardship. And we use that in everything we do. We train with it. We onboard with it. We, we have meetings with it. We do, uh, foundational leadership conferences with it. So I'd have to say that's a focus that I rely on a lot using the value system that we grew up on because it served us well and it has something for everyone. Um, I think service is one of my foundational uh, focuses because I think when you serve, you can make an impact in ways that you can't otherwise because you learn to love people. If you serve someone, there's no way you can do something for them and not have good feelings towards them and vice versa. So service, I think after I'm gone, my kids will probably say she was one who served, (laughs) which I'll be grateful for. So there are probably others, but... I was just going to expound on service. So not, we, we had, our family had the privilege to get to know Pamela Atkinson a little bit uh, a couple of years ago. And she gave us a wonderful opportunity to go and to serve food and um, also to be able to, to give out clothing to the homeless on Christmas day, a couple of years ago. And as we were there serving with our kids, I looked up and I noticed two people that, were serving at the beginning and they were still serving at the end several hours later and it was you and your husband and I <laughs> was so impressed with that and I'm wondering if you can talk maybe expound a little bit more on some of the things that you're involved with around service and also why service is so important to you and how you serve. Well, I think service is an example and it's an example to save your taught. It's an example that we can be. And I think um, I've chosen homeless because they're a group of people that a lot of times they're shunned because they have a bad rap. There are a few that create a bad reputation for for the rest of them. There are a lot of people who are homeless who don't want to be there. By no fault of their own, are they there? There are also a group of people who are homeless because they're They're not willing to get themselves out of that or they're drug addicted or mentally ill, which again, uh, there are reasons for that. So they're a group of people that really need our compassion and our help. And so I find a lot of satisfaction in helping create some outcomes for homeless people that can help them get out of that and to improve their lives and have a better life. So I'm passionate about that. I'm, I'm passionate about anything that promotes education because I think education is one of the ways we will continue to be a great nation. But if our young people are not educated, they don't understand why we are who we are. And I think there are a lot of universities nowadays that don't even teach history. So we've created a program called driven to teach where we have um, a trip every year that teachers who teach history can apply for 
and they get to go on a trip to a place in the country where history happened, like the Civil War or the Founding Fathers or uh, those kinds of things where they can spend a week and learn hands-on what those people did to create for our country the freedoms that we have. And then they go back to their students and teach and they are passionate about it. And, and I think we've reached about a million students that way in the years that we've been doing that. So to me, education is one of those foundational things that I'm passionate about. I think the more we can help our young people learn about who we are and how we got here, the better we'll be. Um, so those are, those are ways that I feel like I can serve. Yeah. And in that same, um, around that same topic of service, you know, and obviously in the BYU Management Society there, typically our audience is full of Latter-day Saints, right? To have busy professional lives, busy family lives, and also some demands that come from, from church and in their service. And sometimes it's easy to sort of default to, well, our service opportunities come from our church, uh, invitations, you know, and what advice would you give to make sure we don't get too trapped into that? box of service that is only comes through our traditional service or our traditional church opportunities? Well, I think one of the things we need to do is realize service doesn't have to be big. We can serve every day in small ways mm. and get just as much satisfaction out of it. I mean, just holding a door for somebody who's got their arms full, that, that's service. Taking care of your mother when she's feeling ill, that's service. Um, a kind word, shared lunch, you know, there are lots of little things, but there are other ways that you can create service to magnify itself. I know we have a large family and we have a, a um, foundation and I I've, I've started thinking about my grandchildren and how can I teach them to share what they have and to be philanthropic. And so we've decided that helping them understand what it takes to find a worthy cause and go through the process of vetting them and seeing what their needs are and coming back to our foundation and saying, I think this is someone, someone who could use our help. They have to go find it. They have to come and present it. And then they have to go give them the money. And that's a way they understand that they have a reach that can make a difference in the world. So there are a lot of things we can do that. And I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, but. That's really helpful. Absolutely. And you know, I'm curious, <clears throat> I've heard a little bits and pieces here and there about when you and Larry bought the jazz um, a long time ago. And I'm curious if maybe you could tell us, the, more of the story or the whole story and, and what went into consi the, your consideration around um, buying the jazz that would that, that obviously had to be a huge consideration for both of you. Oh, it was, we had been in business about six years. Um, we, we did not have a big net worth. We were leveraged quite a bit because we had bought three or four, maybe five dealerships in those six years and leveraged our net worth on that and trying to build it up. But then when they, when the jazz, they actually came to Utah the same year we moved back from Colorado. So 1979, but they had never made money. They had struggled every year to make payroll and they'd done many creative things like play in Las Vegas. And then they had to sell Dominic Wilkins to get some money to make payroll. And, <laughs> and they sent out a letter to some businessmen and asking for uh, an investment in the jazz. And Larry got one of those letters. And he said, boy, I, I think it's important for the jazz to be in Utah, but I, I am not sure that's the way to do it. Well, Dave Checkets was the general manager at the time. And he said, can I come and visit with you? So they had a conversation about the Utah Jazz. Larry came home and talked to me about it. He said, you know, well, and by the way, we had never been to a jazz game at that point. We were not basketball fans. We had been in Colorado, but we had not had time to do it here. And, and he came home and he said, this is a really important issue. 
the jazz are really important to the economy of Utah and to the reputation of Utah. And if there's any way we can help, we, you really should try to do it. So we talked about it. He reviewed finances. He went, he was a very creative businessman. He went over it in his mind over and over and over. And one day he said, you know, the jazz just cannot leave Utah. And we had made the decision to do what we could. And as one last effort, he said, you know, I, I think I should go talk to President Hinckley. Mm -hmm. President Hinckley at the time was not the prophet. He was the acting president of the church. Ezra Taff Benson was sick. Mm -hmm. But Larry had a relationship with President Hinckley. So he called one day and he said, I, I really would like to come and visit with President Hinckley if he's available. And his secretary said, well, he's got about 10 minutes right now if you can be here. In five minutes, he'll have a 10-minute window. Larry said, I'll make it, because he was right outside driving around the block. So he went in and visited with President Hinckley, and uh, Larry explained what he was looking at, uh, looking at doing and his troubled thought process. And, you know, investing $8 million was way beyond our net worth at the time. So President Hinckley listened to him, and when he was through, he said, well, there are three things that I would like you to know. Number one, never, ever jeopardize yourself or don't put yourself in jeopardy financially, you or your family or your business. Make sure that you can handle whatever it is you invest in. Now, that was... That was very serious because we were leveraging everything. And, uh, but Larry was very creative and very sure of himself. Number two was, if you do this, your life will change forever. You will be living in a fishbowl because people will be curious about you. They'll be watching you. They'll be criticizing you. You will have scrutiny everywhere you go. So you have to be aware of that and understand that that's going to put a strain on you. Number three was you have to understand that it's very, very important to the church that the jazz stay in Utah. And that one really surprised him. And he said, well, why is that? Why would you put that in there? And he said, you have to understand that Basketball scores are reported all over the world, and the Utah Jazz scores are reported. But when people hear Utah, they normally think Mormons. So when they hear Utah Jazz, it's going to give us touch points around the world because people will say, oh, Utah, Utah Jazz, Mormons. And, he, and then he said, and besides that, you can come back to me in years to come and tell me why it was important that the Jazz stay in Utah. Oh. And so with, though, with that advice, Larry came home and he said, I'm going to try and do this. Hmm. So he had to go find a consortium of banks that would loan him the money and get it done in a really short time frame. But he was able to do that. Hmm. And I have to tell you, as time went on, those three pieces of advice have been really foundational because... Hmm. Being financially stable is really important. And we have never, ever put our personal finances in jeopardy to make our business grow. And living life in a fishbowl is really true. Everybody wants to know who you are, what you're doing, and how you're doing it. And it wasn't that hard for us, but it was very hard for our children because they were young and they were impressionable and we were not wealthy, but it made people think we were wealthy. And so they were treated with some prejudices and some, you know, some things that were hard for them to deal with. And the third one, we, we realized that living life in a way that represented the church in a good light was always important. 
And we always tried to do that with our business and with the jazz to have good foundational values, to, to be respectful, to live with integrity, to treat people with respect and, and hire players who represented what we believed in and not, not a bunch of um, people who didn't understand what our culture was, who were willing to take on our, our desire to be a respectable team. And, and we've always tried to do that. And I think we've had really good players. Once or twice we've missed on that, but you can't be 100% in everything. <laughs> so yeah. I, the advice has served us very well. That's great. Wonderful story. I love that. And uh, um, with that, you know, just establishing even in your basketball operations, you know, that civility and respect with, with such large organizations, was there anything you did to make sure that everybody was, was bought into that, those values? Well, it, yes, we deliberately taught them and, and we um, expected people to understand who we were and what we stood for. And we partly did that. Larry did it very well just by living the life he did and expecting people to live up to the same standards he did. After he was gone and I was new in, in the business, um, creating the program of who we are was very important. Mm. Because that established for sure what we believed in and what we expected and how we permeated the business with that. Well, Gil, we are so grateful to you. Thank you so much for your time uh, today. I know we've taken you right up to the edge of it and wanted to just thank you so, so much for, for um, being with well, us today. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> I got lots more know, questions on my list that you said. <laughs> we, well, if you want to take the full three hours, we, you know, we, we offered that. So, well, I'm, I'm fine with whatever you want to do. I do have another. <laughs> at three o'clock <laughs> we are we are we are great and uh again thank you so much for being with us we thank all of our listeners for being with us today we'll be back again next month with another episode of the moral and ethical leadership podcast by the byu management society have a great week thank you